What is up boys and girls, it's Seb here with Modify Up. In today's episode, I've got both of the AZ motors stripped down, ready for inspection. I want to show you exactly what's different between the two motors and what parts are interchangeable. This is another long one, so grab another big ass drink. So last week, you watched as we tore down both of the AZ motors so that we could clean everything up and finally take some measurements. If you haven't seen that video, go back and watch it. We'll be here when you get back. We know that both motors are from the same family, so there's a very high chance that all the parts will be interchangeable. But what parts are actually different? We're gonna start at the top of the motor and work our way down the cylinder head to the front of the motor and finally onto the rotating assembly. We'll also measure the cylinder head volume and take a look at the blocks in detail. So the aim of this is to destroke the 2AZ to lower the piston speed at the expense of displacement. We're giving up swept volume in an effort to give the con rods and crankshaft a fighting chance of survival at 10,000 plus RPM. The goal is to build a reliable motor to handle sustained high RPM. The 1AZ is what's called a square motor, meaning that its bore and stroke are equal. Measuring in at 86 mm bore and 86 mm stroke. The 2AZ on the other hand is an undersquare motor, meaning that the stroke is greater than the bore. Measuring in at 88.5 mm bore and a filthy 96 mm stroke, the undersquare design is used to promote low down torque with the large stroke enabling more twisting force of the crankshaft as the pivot point is further away from the center of the crank. But for me, the ideal starting base is an oversquare motor, meaning that the bore is greater than the stroke. Once we're finished, the 1AZ will boast a large 89mm bore with the shorter 86mm stroke. This is by no measures a short stroke motor, as the ideal stroke would be closer to around 75 to 76mm, but without shortening the deck height and going full custom on the timing assembly, this will be enough to reach my goals. In stock trim, the theoretical piston speed of a 2AZ at 10,000 RPM is 32 meters per second, whereas the 1AZ piston speed would be around the 28 meters per second at 10,000 RPM. Doesn't sound like much, but think about how much velocity something is carrying at 4 meters per second. That's equal to 14.4 kilometers per hour. This could be the difference between throwing a rod completely out of the block or simply painting a big end bearing. The other big factor that will affect our 10,000 RPM goal is the cylinder head and its components. We need to ensure we have enough flow through the head to allow the engine to breathe at high RPM. Without getting this thing on a flow bench, I'm gonna throw around some speculation here. I don't believe airflow will be a problem with this cylinder head. As technology has changed, so have cylinder heads, with F1 and high-end engines being produced with very low included valve angles on both intake and exhaust, as is the case with the AZ cylinder heads. The ideal valve angle is now thought to be around the 25 to 30 degree mark, with the AZ coming in at a narrow 27.5 degrees. Narrow valve angles allow for straighter, steeper, and larger port sizing. These straighter, steeper intake ports markedly reduce intake flow resistance. They also improve cylinder charging and combustion efficiency. This means that more air can physically enter the combustion chamber. The ports on the cylinder head with wider valve angles are usually less inclined and typically offer the air a less direct path to dump airflow at an ideal angle onto the valve heads. Also of note is the solid valve train arrangement in the cylinder head where shimless buckets are used. The bucket itself is the shim, so without the need for dirty rocker arms, we'll throw some double valve springs titanium hardware and the appropriate size camshafts and we have all the ingredients for a spicy 10,000 RPM meatball. With that, let's take a look at the actual differences starting with the valve covers. I'll keep it consistent and show all the 2AZ parts on the left hand side of the bench and the 1AZ parts on the right hand side. So these are almost identical with some very subtle differences. 
The 2AZ has a slight recess at the front left hand side of the valley which is used to route wiring through. The 1AZ is completely flat resulting in a slightly larger volume inside the baffled section of the valve cover. Flipping these over we can see that the 2AZ actually has an extra baffle inlet to compensate for the loss of volume. This is an extra point for oil to push its way up into the breather system, so I'll be using the 1AZ valve cover for a cleaner look and extra breathing capacity. Moving down we have the camshafts. Now there's a lot of conjecture around the internet saying that the only difference between the AZ camshafts is duration, which is the amount of time the camshaft begins to open the valve all the way until it's fully closed measured in crankshaft degrees. Toyota made a change to these specifications on all AZ motors in the model year of 2006, meaning that all AZ motors made after 2006 had upgraded camshafts. The original specs were 236 degrees intake duration and 228 degrees exhaust duration on both 1AZ and 2AZ motors. The 06 update changed the intake duration to 248 degrees intake and the exhaust remained the same. The result in a long intake duration is obviously to increase valve overlap. This is where both intake and exhaust valves are actually open at the same time to aid in scavenging which in turn reduces emissions. Now, given that both of these engines are early builds, i.e. pre-2006, I didn't bother measuring duration since there was only one specification. The camshaft lift on the other hand is a different story. With many different measurements being thrown around, I decided to measure it for myself. Here's a camshaft load. Quite simply, we need to measure the base circle of the camshaft. Then we measure the highest point of the load. Then we minus the base circle from the highest point and this gives us our lift in millimeters. Now, whenever you're doing precise engine measurements, you should be using the most accurate equipment you have. So I learned out my micrometer set and it never came back. So I'm gonna have to improvise here and use these verniers to measure. This isn't accurate to the thousandth, but it's close enough to get an idea. Also, we'll be using aftermarket cams anyway, so this is all in the name of research. Starting on the 2AZ camshaft, our base circle is 37.2 millimeters, with a lobe measurement of 46.8 millimeters. This means that the intake cam of the 2AZ has a total lift of 9.6 millimeters. Now, onto the 1AZ intake cam, our base circle measurement is the same at 37.2 millimeters, with a lobe measurement of 46.4 millimeters leaving us with a total lift of 9.2 millimeters. Not 8.2 millimeters, or 8.4, or 8.6, or 9.4, as the internet will tell you. This gives us a 0.5 millimeter delta between the two cams, and although small, will make a difference, especially when it comes down to piston clearance with an interference engine. Onto the exhaust cams, and they're both identical with a 37 millimeter base circle and a 46 mil lobe measurement leaving a total lift of nine millimeters. What's interesting is that the exhaust camshaft base circle is actually smaller than the intake cam due to the difference in valve heights. So yes, the camshafts are interchangeable. So if you're looking for a cheap upgrade, dropping a 2AZ intake cam into a 1AZ is about as cheap as you can get. Both VVTi systems are identical, offering a valve timing adjustment range of 50 degrees. Onto the valves, springs, retainers, and collets. Both AZ motors share the exact same valve components with both intake valve heads measuring 34 millimeters with a total length of 101.7 millimeters and exhaust valves measuring in at 29.5 millimeters head diameter with a valve length of 101.2 millimeters. Again, the retainers and collets are identical along with the valve springs with a free height of 45.7 millimeters. These will be replaced with double valve springs, titanium retainers and collets with 1mm oversized valves and seats. So for parity's sake, these are identical. Moving on to the cylinder heads. Here is where I definitely expect to see some obvious differences given that the two motors have different stroke lengths and different compression ratios. Looking at the heads themselves, you can see just how massive the intake and exhaust ports are with a straight shot onto the valve face. I'm no expert on porting, so I'll have to call in some help here to see if we need to make any modifications to the bowl and seat area to help this breathe at high RPM. 
But in my experience, our turbo sizing is going to play a more important role in flowing the air through the head, more than any porting changes can give us. If this was a non-turbo build, I'd be paying a lot more attention to the porting. But boost is the spice of life. If I wanted an NA build, I would have built a 20 valve. Another great feature of the 2AZ head is the direct port fuel injection. This means the injectors spray directly onto the intake valves and not further upstream in the inlet manifold. This is not to be confused with the FXE direct injection where the fuel is injected directly into the combustion chamber. After running my fine tooth comb over both the cylinder heads, I couldn't find a difference between them at all, even down to the casting marks. Literally the only thing I used to tell them apart was the casting numbers on the heads. So I decided to CC the heads to see if the combustion chamber volume was the same. So spark plug went in, some Vaseline on the valve heads and around the combustion chamber and I was ready to check the volume. Yep, I was ready to check the... <laughs> Shit. Check the... <sighs> yes, both are identical with a total combustion chamber volume of 63.5 cc's. I didn't have a burette so I had to improvise. One thing to note here is the coolant passages in the cylinder head. This will become apparent when we look at the head gaskets. Here, the head gaskets are identical other than the bore diameter. You can see the bore diameter difference with the 2AZ head gasket laid on top of the 1AZ head gasket. What I found the most interesting is that other than the tiny holes between the sleeves, there are only two holes for the coolant to circulate between the block and the head right in front of cylinder number one. I've laid them on a rag so you can see the ports. Whether or not this is going to be adequate, I'll have to do some research as I'll be running a block guard to stiffen up the top of the sleeves. And this may cause hot spots at the top of the bore with no coolant flow going through it. I may have to create some new paths for the coolant to pass through. Next, we have our timing cases. These are 100% identical, which can be seen here with the exact same part number cast onto the inner side of the timing case. I might look at adding another breather vent at the top here, considering there's a lot of churn that happens in this front casing. Moving on to the lower sump, although at first glance they look identical, the 2AZ is slightly larger by 200mm. What's important here is the actual shape of the sump. The 2AZ has a much rounder profile with a higher rear section where the cross member will sit in a rear wheel drive layout. The 1AZ sump is much more square and flat in both its overall profile and where the cross member will sit. If I lay them side by side here, you can see just how much of a difference there will be clearance wise if I use the 1AZ sump, although it will require a very specific oil pickup angle, which is a bit more forgiving with the 2AZ sump given its rounder shape. Now we can get the mid sumps on the bench. As we saw in last episode, the mid sump doubles as a lower block skirt and helps provide rigidity to the whole block. This is where the balance shafts are situated in the 2AZ. Again, the 1AZ uses the mid sump as a simple windage tray to separate the sitting oil from the spinning crank. In terms of material, the 2AZ mid sump is more heavily braced with solid bridges to accommodate the two rotating shaft journals. Whereas the 1AZ has two hollow channels which are cross braced along the channels for strength. It's common practice to delete these balance shafts in a 2AZ, although particular attention must be paid to the oil passages as high pressure oil is fed to the balance shaft journals. These must be blocked off when deleting the balance shafts. Since we already know we're going to be using the 1AZ crank, it'd be silly not to use the 1AZ mid sump as well. In terms of differences between the two mid sumps, other than the balance shaft, the oil drain guide for the blocks are shaped differently, with the 2AZ finishing in a rectangular shape and the 1AZ using the shape of a triangle. The rectangle shape is a constraint of having the balance shaft housing in the way of the block drain, but on measurement they both share the same cross-sectional area, with the 1AZ having an easier flow path. Below this we can see that the oil spinning off the crank is nicely directed to one side in the 1AZ, which is then funneled down into the sump, 
Whereas the 2AZ has no such oil deflection and the excess oil is forced to make its way through the spinning balance shafts into the sump. This is designed to give the balance shaft extra lubrication, but in deleting this, I'm hoping to reduce any churn and cavitation in the crankcase, resulting in lower crankcase pressures. Next up are the oil pumps. Externally, you can see that the 2AZ has a two-piece cover and pickup assembly with a large two-bolt flange pickup, whereas the 1AZ pickup is cast onto the back of the oil pump rear cover. This makes the 2AZ oil pump immediately more attractive for conversions as you're able to move the oil pickup to wherever you need in the sump using extensions. The 1AZ pickup is rigidly fixed so any alteration to the engine angle will see the pickup in the wrong position in the sump. Having said that, the rear covers are actually interchangeable, provided you use the longer studs for the pickup flange. Now, popping these pumps open, they are absolutely identical internally, all the way down to the pressure relief springs. With the lack of performance parts out there for these engines and me not wanting to go dry sump, I'll simply be testing the spring pressure on the relief and replacing it for a stiffer spring to raise the total maximum oil pressure. In addition to this, I'll be running an oil accumulator as a safeguard in the event of loss of oil pressure. Moving on to the blocks now, and you can see that there are Siamese bores with an open deck block. Here you can see the large oil drains on the intake side of the block. Given that the oil drains are on one side of the block only, it's critical to get the engine slanted correctly when doing a conversion, otherwise the oil will pull in the head. Now the oil can drain down the front of the timing case, but for that to happen, it means that the engine already has three quarters of its oil sitting in the head before it can make it past the camshaft level and into the timing case. It's more likely to get pushed out into the breather system than down into the timing case. And at 10,000 RPM, we need all the oil to be down in the sump and not trapped anywhere else. I don't see the need for any oil restrictors given the size of those massive oil drains. Now think back to the head gasket and how there was only two ports for the coolant to pass through the head gasket. Here is where the water transfer between the block and head occurs, right in front of number one cylinder. In the later model AZ motors, Toyota added a plastic spacer that sits inside the water jacket around the bores. This is an attempt to keep the water volume up higher around the hottest part of the bores. I need to find one of these since we'll be running a block guard and I want to keep everything as cool as possible. As I've said before, the AZ motors have a nasty habit of pulling head bolt threads out of the block after they overheat. The problem is not the material per se, it's more so the amount of thread engagement in the block. So we'll be drilling out the bolt holes, running extra long thread inserts and oversized ARP studs to eliminate this issue. So flipping over, we can see a distinct lack of a crank girdle. I'll be 3D printing some prototypes here to see if I can fit something in that will clear all the parts in that area. This will be the only thing that we can do to strengthen the block. Being an early block, there are no provision for oil squirters here. This will result in a lack of piston cooling, so I'm gonna to have to find either a newer block or retrofit these in. In terms of differences, the blocks are identical other than the bore size. How can that be, you might ask, given that they have different stroke lengths? Well, Toyota tends to do things a little differently, whereas some manufacturers use different block heights to achieve a larger swept volume, Toyota take a much simpler approach with the rotating assemblies. Which leads me onto the cranks. Here are the cranks and balance shafts. You can see that there's a large ring gear pressed onto number three counterweight on the 2AZ crank used to drive the balance shafts. The balance shafts themselves consist of two plastic gears and one alloy gear. As I said in my last video, these shafts are not related to crank balancing and as such are not timed to the crank rotation. They're simply used to cancel out any harmonics created by the engine itself. Note that the driven gear off the crank is actually spring-loaded, again to help with reducing harmonics. Other than the stroke length and the balance shaft drive, the cranks are identical. So, how do we get the extra displacement if only the cranks are different and the block heights are the same? Say hello to the rods and pistons. This is where the magic happens. Altering the combination of crank and pistons, we are able to change the amount of swept volume and displacement the engine has. The 1AZ and 2AZ conrods are 
100% identical and share the same part number. Laying one on top of another, you can see the center to center length is 149.5 millimeters with the big end and small end journal diameters identical. These rods are pathetically small and I'm surprised they even work in stock form. Here's a real con rod for comparison's sake. You be the judge. Would you run stock AZ rods? For those guys doing turbo conversions on stock 2AZs, you are on borrowed time. I'll be running HBM rods, so these are just for comparison's sake. Now we can move on to the pistons, and these along with the crank are the critical parts for altering the stroke. Apologies for not cleaning these. Without stating the obvious difference in bore diameters, we can see that the gudgeon pin heights are different, with the 1AZ using a much taller crown to take up the deck height distance. The ring lands are also much thicker on the 1AZ pistons, making them a much better choice for turbo application. I won't go into compression ratios here, but the piston tops themselves feature a dish design with the valve reliefs more prominent on the 1AZ due to the smaller bore diameter, leaving less room for the dished portion, hence larger valve reliefs. We have two options here. One, order 2AZ pistons with a custom pin height, or we can order 1AZ pistons with a custom diameter of 89mm. After seeing the difference in ring lands, it's a no-brainer. The 1AZ pistons, hands down. So there you have it. Those are the differences between 1AZ and 2AZ motors. So which parts will I be using here, you're asking? Let's go through it. From left to right, we have the 1AZ valve cover for extra breather volume. I'll be using 2AZ aftermarket camshafts. The 2AZ cylinder head, although the bare heads are identical, the 2AZ timing cover, again, these are identical. The 1AZ mid sump deleting the balance shafts. The 1AZ crankshaft for the shorter stroke. The 1AZ oil pan for the extra cross member clearance. The 2AZ oil pump with the custom oil pickup and spring relief. 2AZ H beam rods and custom 1AZ forged pistons. This will net us a total displacement of 2140 cc's, making this a 2.1 litre motor. We'll also be saving 7.1 kilograms in weight using the 1AZ mid sub and crank. That is it guys, I hope you have a better understanding of what I'm trying to achieve here. Now the next couple weeks I'm going to put the engine build to the side, while I focus on getting the engine mounted up and looking at the gearbox options for Project Wonder. If you like what you saw today, make sure you drop me a like or even consider subscribing. Thanks for watching. Okay, bye.